Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now, today's video has been voted in by my Patreon members. Hey guys, thanks a bunch. They've requested some of my personal stories from when I was in the army in Cyprus. Now, I was in Cyprus 81, 82, 83. Um, and what a time I had. Now, just a, a little bit of a background. Cyprus, Eastern Mediterranean, one of the most beautiful islands that you can imagine divided by war. You have the Turkish zone, which is the northeastern part of Cyprus, and then the southern western part is the Greek Cypriots. It's a sad story. If you want to have a read about it, there is a little bit of an invasion by one side, then a massive invasion by the other. And right in the middle of it all are some very small bases that uh, the British Army occupies. Some of the ground is owned, some of it is leased, so it, there's no underhanded colonial business there. They are the sovereign base areas. And what I was asked when I'd finished my tours in Northern Ireland, you know, where would I like to go? And I decided I'd like to go to Cyprus, the blue seas of the Mediterranean. Uh, and it's quite an amazing little time because whilst there, I volunteered to go and police a very interesting camp called Pergamos up at the eastern end of the island. I'd come up with a suggestion that some of the civilians needed policing in Limassol, and my officer commanding suggested that I go to the other end of the island and have a look at a more serious problem, Pergamos. It's a, a camp, over 300 people lived in it, civilians and military, right next to the Turkish line on the eastern end of Cyprus. The UN line that divides Cyprus uh, came into it and so it was quite a bit of a unique place. The security is by the Turkish people there and most of my work is the Turkish Cypriots with a smattering of Greek Cypriots. It was a happy place. So Pergamos camp. My duties, police the camp, patrol the outside. I had a seven and a half stone gnashing German shepherd, Mark the dog, who was my assistant. I was given a push bike, a motorcycle and the use of a Land Rover. I was made. There are some things that uh, I got up to in Cyprus around Pergamos that I can't discuss because it has to do with British intelligence and all that kind of stuff. But there was one incident when a bomb went off outside the camp and blew up our sewerage works. And I, I ooh, all of a sudden, I've got uh, extra soldiers, there's more barbed wire, and we've got real bullets in the guns, and it's become very, very serious indeed. Ayatollah Khomeini apparently had sent some people, insurgents, over to Cyprus to sort the British out. So everything goes on a, a serious footing. And I get, a, <laughs> I get a call to go down to the Kalia, and I say, right, this is a job you've got to do. Um, cut a long story short, I had to, that night, middle of the night, turn up at a grid reference location on the southern coast. And so off I went on my motorbike. That's all my briefing was. And when I arrive, there's nobody there. It's pitch black. And I've kind of stopped my motorbike and I've got my torch and I'm looking at And the voice says, uh, hello. <laughs> there's an officer coming up. All camouflaged up, middle of the night. He says, we're waiting for a reinforcements to be dropped off by the Royal Navy. They're bringing in some armour and it's going to drop on the beach down below. And I thought, there's a beach? I couldn't see anything. So he said, if you just wait here and then when the time comes, we'll give you instructions of where you to take the packets of armour. These were armoured cars, basically. So I sat there quite bemused, um, not knowing that all around me, there were dozens and dozens of soldiers but everybody was keeping it quiet because this was a bit of a secret. I almost started to giggle. God, this is so exciting. And then I heard right out at sea the heavy throbbing of some marine engines. And then there's a flash of light from the horizon. Do -do 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 and then down on the beach. Do -do 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 and I'm going, this is just like D-Day. This is so exciting. I don't think anybody else is excited. Just Kevin and his motorbike. And then lights come on. Remember, it's a secret, yeah? And the lights come on, and the British Army, bless it, had actually built a jetty going out into the sea, and then coming towards the beach, to do, to do, to do, were landing crafts. Wow, this is fantastic, I'm thinking. I'm there, I've got all the brush off my motorbike, I've stood it up, I'm ready. And the first one comes in, and just as it's coming in, 
it veers slightly and goes straight into the jetty, smashing it to pieces. Another landing craft hits the second landing craft, tries to drop its board, but it's too soon. There's chaos down there. Then one of the armoured fighting vehicles catches fire. And I'm watching all of this thinking to myself, oh my goodness me, this, this is incredible. If I'd have had a camera, I'd have loved to have taken photographs. Well, when it was all over and the Navy had gone and the Army had uh, tried to salvage, an embarrassed officer came up to me and says, I will no longer be required. Apparently what my job was, was to lead these squadron of armoured cars off the beach and away to a location. But unfortunately, they didn't make it. What I did find out was the next day, it was all made good and the vehicles could find their own way. It was supposed to be a secret operation in the dead of night to reinforce the British Army. Well, it failed. And I thought it was really exciting. Another story is, it's, uh, it just shows you how things can happen and you have no idea what's going on. So I used to patrol my camp, the three mile perimeter. I used to patrol it every day, twice a day with the uh, Mark the dog or on my motorcycle. But every Monday I had to go and have a debrief with the garrison commander down at um, Decalia, uh, Colonel McLeod, I think it was his name, if I remember correctly, from the Irish Rangers. What a guy. He used to come in, come in, Corporal Hex, sit down. And we'd have a coffee and he, he basically used to say to me, so what have you done this week? because I used to get up to one or two interesting things. And this one morning he says, he's had a complaint from the Turkish authorities just the other side of the barbed wire from Pergamos. And I says, oh, what's going on, sir? He says, have you built a gun emplacement at the back of your camp? I went, no, no, sir. He says, uh, an observation post, anything where you can observe the Turks? No, sir, nothing. He says, um, go and investigate. So I go off on my motorbike and I do a circle of the camp. I can't find anything. And then I had to think about it. Right, if the Turks are observing something, it's got to be from this rough area. So off I go, still can't see anything. So I park up my motorbike, get the old dog out, old Mark, and I walk towards the Turkish line. Can't see anything. So I turn around. As I'm coming back to camp, I just caught the lip of a row of sandbags. And I thought, what on earth is that? Nothing should be there. So I patrol up to it, and sure enough, there is an emplacement. Sandbags, all camouflaged up, a fire step, a deeper part, and they'd started to dig into the bank there. And then I noticed behind it, right in our barbed wire, some planks had been laid into the barbed wire so people could crawl in and out. And I was absolutely stunned by this because it was perfect. And then I noticed that there was some paper on, on a board where somebody had been observing what the Turks are doing and what their movements were. And I thought, well, there's, there's no operation here. There's, no, there's nothing going on. What on earth has happened? So I climbed through and uh, found where the boards ended up. It was in the back garden of an 11-year-old young boy. And it was the local kids a little bit of a gang of kids. They were no trouble. They were fine kids, but they'd been playing war. So I fed the intel back to the garrison commander and he fed it back to the Turks who then sent a reply and said, you frightened us to death because they look as if they got guns, which they had, plastic ones, and their dad's steel helmets. They were playing war. Nicely though, the Turks said, as long as we know what they're doing, we know it's the kids, that's great, let them play. And it was just one of those wonderful incidents that we had at Pergamos camp. But now I have a rather a sad story. Now we all knew that there'd been massacres and atrocities committed in Cyprus over the years, especially in 1974. But I didn't realize it had been quite so close to home, uh, one of the little villages near where I lived. I'd noticed that there's never any kids out playing and no women there. And uh, I found out later that there'd been a massacre in that village. And it's, it's, it's kind of a reality check, isn't it? When somebody says, well, the reason there are no women or children here is because of this. So I was unaware that I actually had a victim working for us in the camp. We'll call him Suleiman. He didn't speak very good English. And it came to my attention that he spent most of his off-duty time sleeping rough behind the, the cookhouse, even in the wintertime, close to the ovens. So I, I said, well, what's going on? 
And the foreman, who was a Turkish Cypriot, came with Suleiman to answer some questions. And basically what had happened was this. Suleiman used to be a shepherd in, in the local village. And he'd taken all the sheep and goats or whatever. We used to call them geep because we got confused. Was it a sheep? Was it a goat? We just never found out. They'd take them out. And it was rough terrain, so they'd be out for quite some time. But as this chap was taking the sheep out, he heard gunfire from the village. And when he turned around, the smoke, as he ran back to the village, it had been attacked. And I don't want to get into the, the arguments of the Greeks did this, the Turks did this. It was a civil war and it, it was horrible. Suleiman saw what they were doing because he lost his family in that attack and he was gunned down. As he lay there, badly wounded, he saw that these people were coming to finish him off. So holding his wound, it was in his lower right side, he ran and he ran through the gorse bushes of what's called the Bondu in Cyprus. It's basically the scrubland desert of the middle part of Cyprus. And his flesh was torn to pieces. Now he showed me the bullet hole in his side. And uh, he said, I was found by a British army patrol and they, they took care of me. And they brought me to Pergamos camp eventually. And this is where I've been ever since. You, you, I, you are my family. That's basically what he was saying. And I checked all of this out and yeah, yeah, it's true. Poor old Solomon had lost everything. House, home and family. And his family was the British Army. So I've got a, a lovely little story to finish on. I'm out on a, a long patrol going out on my motorcycle. And I got off my bike. And I've got my binoculars. I'm having a look around. And I heard somebody playing a flute. And what I discovered, it was almost like a scene from the Bible. Uh, just over the bluff there were some rocks and there was two or three hundred deep sheep or goats and there's a shepherd boy 11 12 13 he turned around he got an old rifle over his shoulder i says to him mechaba and mechaba umba he stood up and then straight away shook my hand and i recognized him as one of the local kids and uh, he was there looking after the sheep and he plays his flute to keep them calm. And I'm looking around and thinking to myself, this could be a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago. And we sat down together. I got some rations out of my pannier on my bike and some water. And he had a, a, like a handkerchief parcel on a stick, like Dick Whittington kind of thing. And he opens it and he has some Sheftalia sausage. He has some cheese, halloumi and, and various bits of bread and some olives and a boiled egg. I remember it. And he cut everything in half, pushed half towards me. So I divided my rations and we sat just in beautiful silence, looking over the Bondu of Cyprus, looking at these geep as it were. And when we finished, I turned around to him, shook his hand, Tesha Kura him. Thank you very much. And he waved me goodbye. And as I'm going away, I thought to myself, what a wonderful place Cyprus is. What a beautiful place. How peaceful. And yet torn apart by war. So sad, really. Beautiful at the same time. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. My stories of being that brave British soldier in Cyprus. If you did, like share and subscribe and please remember to put on the all notification button so you know what's coming down the line now before i go a quick call out to some of my patreon members now jd nice to see you the other day we had a splendid beer in in the legion there sebastian bender and sandy higgins are the other two hey guys without you i wouldn't be able to make these videos and i'll tell you i've got dozens of soldiers that i'm painting for the next phase of the hundred years war but for now Bye-bye.